Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you joining us here today for the Regional Resilience Hub virtual summit closing session. We're really excited to get to this point. It's after two days of incredibly interesting programming from our Regional Resilience Hub leads, uh, the International Center for Climate Change and Development, who led the South Asia Regional Hub, South South North and Slum Dwellers International that led the Africa Regional Hub, and Fundusia Navina that led the Latin American Caribbean Regional Hub. We have representatives from the regional hub leads who are also managing partners of the Resilience Hub, along with the Global Resilience Partnership, uh, Atlantic Council and Resilience Rising. Uh, and we're really looking forward to having an engaging discussion to reflect not only on the past two days of programming, but also reflecting on the past three years of the Resilience Hub, the regional Resilience Hubs, and where we want to move uh, towards COP29, uh, on climate, COP16 and biodiversity, and then looking ahead to COP30. But I won't spend too much longer on the preamble because we want to jump into a dynamic and interesting conversation with all of our representatives from our managing partners and regional hub leads. But before we get into that, I'd like to turn to Joe Maturi, President of Slum Dwellers International and Chairperson of the Slum Dwellers International Board, to give us some opening remarks, and then we'll jump into the panel discussion and introduce everyone else. Joe, over to you for your opening remarks. Uh uh, thank you very much, uh, Amil. And uh, on behalf of Slum Dwellers International, uh, we are honored. I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to thank the GRP and the organizers of this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, we are honored to be part of this. And I think to my comment is that uh, we are grateful that the climate discussion is getting traction. Uh, the climate discussion is getting the spotlight and the limelight that it requires. And I think in a way, as SDI and specifically working with urban poor communities, we have always tried to put a spotlight on the challenges of climate in urban centers, uh, the challenges of climate, not only the challenges, we also uh, like to, we, we also put a spotlight on what communities are doing in terms of resilience, what are doing in terms of uh, climate mitigation. So we are glad that these discussions, we are, we are beginning to normalize this discussion. We are beginning to demystify uh, the climate agenda. Uh, in Africa, it doesn't seem like it's a foreign concept. I think most people are aware and have seen it's evident, it's very evident now that um, uh, climate here is here with us. We cannot ignore it. Uh, I think in a few years' time, if we, if we don't do something about it now, it's going to be a crisis. So first of my comments, and I think uh, thinking about what we take for to COP, uh, still uh, the, there's a disconnect between the global discussions, uh, whatever is being discussed by the decision makers, whatever is being discussed at all these forums, at COP, at the World Bank, in the New York Climate Change Week, uh, there's some sort of disconnect uh, of, of, of what is actually happening on the ground. And what we like to see is how do we uh, push for local solutions, local discussions, and local uh, to inform the global discussions. The other thing, uh, there's a lot of lip service when it comes to when we talk about uh, what uh, communities are doing in terms of climate mitigation. How do we also push for, we amplify the work that is being done by local actors, local partners. The other message probably is to think about, there's a lot of talk about resources uh, around the climate, climate financing. Uh, there are so many brokers in between. Uh, the climate financing does not reach the actors, does the climate finance do not go to the actual intended beneficiaries. So those are things that probably, if you have to take to COP, there's so much talk about billions being committed. But we are asking, where is all this money? And I think my third message is, uh, uh, first of all, uh, as GRP, I've seen the uh, initiative that GRP is taking, bringing all these actors together in one space. Uh, so our people in this space, we tend to speak in our own silos, in our own cocoons, do our little things, our little projects. And it will be more beneficiaries if we put our resources, our manpower, speak in one voice, uh, build consensus, what are the priority, 
so those are probably for now what I think it should be important taking forward. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, being part of this discussion. Thank you very much, Amir. I hope I've been brief enough. Thank you very much, Jonah. I think you've helped us segue really well into what will be the start of this panel discussion. For those of you who may not have been following the regional resilience hubs and the resilience hub more broadly over the past few years, the regional hubs have always played a crucial role in the meaningful and authentic amplification of local voices and community voices, as well as that of lesser heard and underrepresented constituencies into global decision making spaces. And Joe, I think you emphasized that excellently in your opening remarks and the need to move away from siloed discussions, but rather moving towards speaking in a unified voice around what is inclusive and transformative resilience action, who is not being heard, and how do we unpack and understand the importance of what those lesser heard voices have to say in these global fora and the relevance uh, not just to action in the global south but uh, global action more broadly. So Joseph thank you for those opening remarks and we really you know for me this is always a fun type of discussion uh, to host, uh, primarily because I get to have it with some of my favorite colleagues from around the world, from organizations that I've had the privilege and pleasure to work with over the past few years. So let me just go through and quickly introduce everyone. I'll give you maybe 30 seconds to, to introduce yourself as well, uh, but we'll do a, round, a quick round robin of introductions. We really want to have quite a bit of back and forth and discussion. So we'll start off uh, with some Sakib Huck, who's the Managing Director of ICAD. So Sakib, you can unmute yourself and just give a very quick 30 second introduction. Hi everybody, my name is Sakib Huck. I'm from the International Center for Climate Change and Development. We're a research and capacity building think tank based in the Global South here in Dhaka, Bangladesh. So good evening to everybody from here, but good afternoon and morning if you're joining us from somewhere online. Thank you, Omil. Thanks, Sakib. Paula Ellinger, who's the Director of Climate Change for Fundacia Novena, over to you for a quick introduction. Hi, I'm Mio and colleagues. A real pleasure to be here today with you, as I said. I'm Paula Ellinger, a Brazilian based in Argentina, but luckily working with several of you around the globe. Uh, I'm. We have made a transition of roles in the past weeks in Avina, so I'm currently the uh, Director for Social Innovation at Avina, and I know that we have among the participants also Juliana Strobo, who is taking the leadership of uh, the Climate Action Direction in Avina. Thanks. Great to see you again, Paula. And a very dear colleague of mine at South South North, we have Patsima Raman. Over to you uh, for a quick introduction. Thank you, Emil, um, and good afternoon, fellow panelists, um, all those joining in online. My name is Patsy Raman. I am from South South North. We are one of the uh, managing uh, partners for the Resilience Hub. I myself has been have been part of the Resilience Hub for the last two years, so this is my second one. Um, it's a really great um, platform and opportunity to work with great um, like like minded people. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, look forward to the, to the discussion. Thanks, Patsimo. And last but not least, uh, Joseph Maniragena from Slum Dwellers International. Over to you for a quick intro. Thank you, Emil. And I guess you should have uh, added that we are neighbors. It's actually five minutes working. Uh, this is Joseph Maniragena from the SDI. SDI is the Slum Dwellers International. Uh, we bring together at least um, affiliate federation and NGO supporting them from over 22 countries. And what we do is just to help mobilize them uh, so that they can speak uh, their voice and uh, when we start, maybe I will share more about what we do and how uh, the GRP has helped uh, us to bring uh, some of the voices really, especially uh, at the COPs. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much, Joseph. 
So as I said, this conversation is not just to reflect on the past two days of really interesting events that covered a range of different priority topics across the three regions represented uh, during uh, this, this summit, but to also pause and reflect on the past three years of having had these regional resilience hubs that really play this crucial role in unpacking and understanding uh, how we meaningfully amplify and ally with lesser-heard and underrepresented constituencies, local voices and communities, and bring that into this global decision-making space, uh, which uh, for, for, for the most part up until this point has been uh, the climate change COP. Um, but we'll see as we get into the conversation how, how our ambitions are aligning for a more holistic uh, and integrated approach across uh, the various different conventions under, uh, or that emerged out of the Rio Convention. But to kick us off, and I think important to, to take this moment to reflect first before we get into the meat of what are the priorities and key messages that we take forward. So keep, I'm going to direct the first question to you. So we have this important mandate as regional resilience hubs uh, feeding into the resilience hub that happens at COP. So reflecting on the past three years from the perspective of ICAD, having led the South Asia regional hub, what have you learned as the regional hub lead in actioning this mandate of meaningfully amplifying these lesser heard voices and constituencies into these global decision-making spaces. And of course, feel free to bring in some of ICAD's broader perspectives as well. Over to you, Sakib. Thank you, Emil, and thank you to all our distinguished panelists who are also going to be picking on some of these. So please do feel free to ask us if there's any issues that we had in doing these for the last three years. I would say there was, from the very beginning, when we started off with this sort of call for applications for people that we wanted to get in to help us with the sessions for the week when we were doing the region, regional hubs in South Asia, the first time we actually started it while the COP was happening. This was during COP26 in Glasgow in, in, in the UK. And that was more of a sort of of way of trying to bridge the gap of bringing the voices directly into the COP space, which was really one of the defining elements, as, as um, Emil mentioned before, that was really one of the reasons we had this initiative start up with all the different partnering organizations. However, if any of you have been to any of these conventions, not just the Climate COP, but uh, similar conventions of that sort, that world is very, very busy. It's very difficult. It's it's almost a bubble on its own, and it's completely impossible to pick up on all the key messages that are happening while you're physically there, let alone something that's happening completely parallelly online. So one of the lessons that we learned is that it shouldn't be something that we do for show. And that was something that when we were doing our steering committee meetings, even in the first year, both in the briefing and, and the post um, sort of reflections, uh, what we call the session to sort of understand how we could make it a bit more impactful. That was one of the things that came through that, yes, this is something that needs to be taken to the international forum, taken to the convention so the negotiators can learn from the experiences of people from the on the ground, from local initiatives, from subnational entities and so on. But to do it in a way where you're not really able to integrate their messages, you're not really getting them to be able to speak to the negotiators directly or to the, the policy makers or the academics, really just does it as a token activity. You're doing it just because you have, you know, the, the funds and availability and partners that want to be engaging, but you're not really able to make that link happen in a meaningful way. So doing it simultaneously as the convention is going on is a very, very difficult uh, way to sort of try and merge this. So then on the second and the third years, what we did is that we staggered it a little bit. We had a number of the sort of um, regional hubs happen throughout the year building up to the convention that usually happens in November and December. And then that also allows for a lot of the interactions that you have during the week because there are a number of organizations that don't necessarily qualify or get accredited to join those conventions, but are actually very active in this space, particularly on adaptation and resilience. It allows us to have that sort of network and bonding beforehand for the people that might actually go to the convention. There's a very small group that goes, regardless of how big the cops are getting and how, how much more attendance that they're getting, it's still a very, very small microcosm. It's not everybody that works in this space, and it really isn't everybody that should be represented that gets to go there. So then it allows us for that little time to build up, to be able to strategize a little bit, work with some partners, build new collaborations, and then gives us that sort of um, momentum going into a convention. And the final thing that I would say is that was not shocking. We've done, uh, you know, similar types of online events and webinars and asked for people to give us expressions on, on sessions. 
there's always enthusiasm when you're working with local entities, particularly on NGOs, on particularly on um, academics, or even in youth groups. They are always, always keen to engage, and they want to learn more, and they want to be able to talk and discuss on how they can do better. And that was not a surprise, but it's always refreshing to have. No, th thanks so much for for that uh, last comment. And I think important to note that the regional hubs, when engaging within their respective regions, have have experienced a lot of enthusiasm for engaging in a space that is region specific, but is also got this mandate of really trying to focus in on who is not being heard, what do they have to say, what are their priorities, and how do we try to your points, I keep to meaningfully amplify this into. Uh, into global decision-making spaces. Patima, do you have any response to that? Yes, sure. Um, I, I, I completely agree um, with Saqib. And I think an important aspect of what we've tried to do um, as the regional hubs, um, including the Africa Regional Hub as well, is to create this ownership of the outputs of the hub um, and, and really focusing on allowing the local experts, uh, you know, leaders, representatives, practitioners to tell their own stories and to share their knowledge. Um, and I think the Resilience Hub is, has created this great platform for doing that. Um, you know, so allowing um, these the, these these less of heard voices to really craft their own key messages, and really all all we do is provide that facilitation and and support to to yeah to amplify them. Um, thanks. Thanks so much for that, Patimo. And you know, uh, just looking at the work that Slum Dwellers International has been doing for many years now as a network, as a movement, as an organization that for many years has brought local level voices from the constituency that Slum Dwellers International allies with and focuses on, which is the urban poor constituency, to global spaces like the World Urban Forum and to COP. Uh, so, Joseph, just turning to you and and you know asking a critical question: Are we seeing progress in these global decision making spaces on the inclusion of local and community voices, priority solutions? Are we seeing that progress that so many of us are calling for? Noting that so many organizations are trying to ally with local voices and bringing them to these international spaces. SDI has been doing this for many many years, and and just getting you to reflect on whether you think we are starting to see this pro, uh, see the progress that we're all trying to work towards. Over to you, Joseph. Uh, thank you so much. And really, um, before I actually come to answer you the question, uh, let me start by thanking uh, the Resilience Hub really for all the support and bringing all of us together. And our chair just mentioned it's a, it's a support which we don't take for granted. Um, to start off, um, and, the, and also my chair did mention that about that, uh, climate change is, is really here. It's not really uh, something we use maybe 20 years ago, 10 years, we used to feel maybe it concerns other people, but it's uh, us, and especially in our case, it's affecting urban poor communities. So the climate crisis, has, it's a, a unique and life-threatening consequences and especially our members, they are the one affected. Uh, but the issue, and that's why we, we, we are really, we feel grateful to be part, where the discussion are held, where the decision are held about solution, we don't see uh, our people or poor urban communities. That, that's where uh, the issue is. And that's how um, the, the Resilience Hub, uh, when they came in, uh, it has been three years now, uh, we have been sending a delegation of slum dwellers themselves to go and attend these high level meetings so that they can be able to speak uh, their voices. You will agree with me that um, while urban poor communities, um, and especially in our case SDI, we have some uh, solution which have been working, others did maybe need not work, but at least we have something which we can share. But what we ask is just a little support so that those uh, which are working can be replicated, but also some other initiatives starting. So when we get opportunity to send delegation to this um, high level meeting, such as COP, for example, last year we sent 
uh, two delegations which went into different times. One went and they spent a week. Another one went to spend a second week. And we managed to bring community leaders, uh, slum dwellers themselves, or the NGO support which support them, who really know what are the issues, but also who have solutions. So to answer your question, it's not easy because uh, when you are really not at the table, it's it's difficult to say uh, that a solution are coming or there is a progress, but it's better than nothing. So we have seen, uh, for example, when our members are at these different um, meetings, they take place, they take part into different um, side event, they get to engage um, the high authorities, and some of them even say it's it's the opportunity to speak to their own uh, local leaders. When you are in your country, uh, some your ministers or your local leaders, they tend to neglect you. But when you meet, for example, last year in Dubai, you become friends, you speak. So they, they have been uh, slow, but I think we are getting there. And uh, with more support, uh, we show we can, we can, we can really uh, move forward. But the problem, uh, one problem which really I want to mention, and, and, and it has uh, been mentioned earlier on, we want to see the climate finance coming down because the solution, they are being implemented at the local level. But if you see, you will ask, where are those uh, being spent? If you look at a different report, billions are being spent on solution, but we don't see them. That's why we are really promoting, we are calling everyone to come on board and let's have implementation at the local level. Let's have those financing come down. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joseph, and, and certainly uh, an important point around how local voices may get the opportunity to engage with their own governments in some of these spaces. I know that that point for me, uh, I believe it was uh, COP27, so two years ago now, we're engaging with SDI colleagues around really emphasizing uh, the uh, value to these local level actors and bringing them to these global spaces and the experience of SDI is how it lends credibility to some of these local level voices. For example, having uh, a big international network like SDI, bringing them to a global space that can then open that door and open that conversation for them to engage with decision makers in their own country. And I thought that that for me was a really interesting point those years ago and certainly pertinent to this conversation as well. And just to put uh, a fine point in it as well, and something that I know through ICAD's work with the South Asia Hub, uh, where they let different constituencies actually lead the events that uh, were being developed and putting them in the driver's seat of that discussion and, and how uh, ICAD needed to actually prove in many ways that there was value for these organizations, these local organizations to be engaging uh, with the regional resilience hub, the South Asia one, but with the resilience hub more broadly. I'm sure many of these constitu uh, constituencies are quite used to having this extractive external partner come in and say, we want to bring you somewhere to come and speak or share your message, but it may not always be clear to them as to how it's materially impacting their day-to-day -day work and the incredible, uh, incredibly important work that they are pursuing. Paula, I want to turn to you. Um, and I, I want to turn to you specifically with this because Avina, of course, is also an accredited entity to the Green Climate Fund. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of discussion and movement in the global discourse on climate finance or on financing locally led adaptation. And so for those who may not be very familiar with the intergovernmental process and the negotiations or how climate finance works or flows, what are some of the entry points that you're seeing from Avina's perspective, uh, both as an accredited entity to the Green Climate Fund through your engagements uh, uh, with the Resilience Hub and more broadly, what are some of the, the entry points for really enhancing the inclusion of local voices and communities in some of these decision-making processes, whether it's in the intergovernmental process or on finance, et cetera. From your experience, from Avina, where, where are some of these entry points that we should be aware of, be familiar of, and perhaps be pushing harder on? Over to you, Paula. Thank you, Amil, for, for the important question. Uh, 
because definitely I think we are all very aligned in this space on the importance of raising the voices of local actor and shifting power. But then the question is, what are the entry points for that, right? Um, I would like to highlight uh, at least two or three entry points. One uh, is knowledge. How do we build uh, information and knowledge that backs the importance of locally led solutions as the most effective type uh, of solution that we can build in face of the climate crisis? And when information and solutions are on the table, then power shifts. We are now working at Avena with uh, waste pickers in Latin America. Uh, we have been working with waste with speakers for several years now, mostly from a social and economic inclusion point of view. And then when we started to build information about how much emissions are they avoiding uh, by recycling different types of materials through their cooperatives, then we have a number to put on the table and the way uh, the decision makers engage with uh, the, the solution of strengthening cooperatives and financing waste picker cooperatives is different because there is a number to put on the table. So I would say one entry point uh, is building information uh, and knowledge that backs uh, the, the value of locally led solutions. That's one. The second is how do we also strengthen institutions and capacities uh, of organizations that are at the local level and also intermediaries that are making these connections between local and global level to uh, navigate all the, the characteristics that we are very familiar of with uh, of climate governance. Uh, and here I refer especially for climate finance, we know that there are different types of barriers and requirements when accessing funds, both from administrative um, and fiduciary standards that are often very challenging for local organizations to, to uh, respond to, but also in terms of the type of evidence that is requested that their solutions are the best ones to be financed. So uh, strengthening institutions, to uh, engage in these spaces, either individually or in coalitions, uh, is another entry point for facilitating access to climate finance. So these were two, right? <laughs> no, great. Thanks so much. And Fatima, I see you'd like to, to come in as well, so please go ahead. Thanks. Yes, I'd just like to agree with Paula and and compliment um, her intervention. Um, just to say that I think with knowledge um, and support to these, um, you know, community leaders groups, um, they can actually and they can and should be empowered to bring their own messages um, to the forefront um, and ensuring that their priorities and needs are not only heard, but that they are also meaningfully integrated into the outcomes of, of decisions and, and to the outcomes of negotiations. Um, and I think it speaks to the point made earlier about, you know, the role of um, national delegations. Um, and, and, and I think that that's, that's one of the key entry points as well. Um, and so encouraging national governments to include representatives from local communities and to engage with them um, and to engage with civil society domestically before, um, you know, ahead of the, the multilateral uh, negotiations and meetings is, is a crucial entry point. I think that this ensures like local um, representatives uh, or, or that local perspectives rather are, are, are present during decision making um, um, and, and allows these, um, you know, lesser heard uh, voices to really um, c come through um, and and in in their own right, as opposed to through external intermediary intermediaries. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, and if I can also add in terms of, you know, the role of partnerships and civil society networks as well, I think building um, these stronger partnerships with, with established civil society networks um, can also provide a very useful entry points um, and, yeah, and, and really create the visibility within the broader um, negotiation process. Thank you, Ova. Great. Thanks so much, Patsimo. And I, I think your last point there, incredibly important as well for parts of the world in which civil society are not enabled, uh, is that partnership as well then globally with civil society in to Joe's point uh, in his opening remarks uh, about being able to speak with a unified voice despite coming from very diverse contexts uh, and approaches. Uh, Joseph, uh, let's switch over to you. I see you have your hand up on our end. And then Joe as well from SDI. But we have a Joe and a Joseph. So we'll start with Joseph and then we'll go over to Joe. Joseph, over to you. You're on mute, Joseph. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Great. I just want to add on what Patimo say just mentioned, and uh, our colleague who spoke also before her. Uh, um, one of the kind of stereotype uh, those uh, big uh, donors or those who don't want really to kind of uh, empower local communities. Uh, one of the element they say they are that they, they can't manage. And, and the SDI work has really established evidence uh, that when the community are organized, uh, they, they, they can uh, provide themselves the leadership, they, can, uh, they have the skills, even they have the capacities to really deliver um, uh, locally led ad adaptation. And one example I can give is, uh, for example, the, the Urban Poor Funds, which was created by uh, slum dwellers themselves and most of them unemployed or into informal sector but they managed to contribute a very small amount on a daily or weekly basis and they have managed those funds yes some have some problem but we have very successful example where they've managed they even a partnered with a, a, the local government to say we have this we can contribute to this. What can you bring a little to support us? So I just want to mention that uh, it's not true that really local community, they don't have the capacities. They do, and they can have even successful, uh, which they can share, uh, which have worked in the past. Thanks. Thanks so much, Joseph. Joe, I see you had your hand up on our end as well uh, to come in, so please do. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think I agree with most of the speakers. Paula mentioned, uh, I think Sakib mentioned, and I think uh, uh, but the previous. We, for someone who has been involved in um, this very high level of global discussion, I've seen for the last 20 years, I've seen, yes, we cannot say that um, civil society doesn't have a table. We cannot say the poor. Uh, that do not have or local communities do not have yes uh, to an extent at uh, some spaces there's a lot of tokenism but for me uh, being on the table is not enough and for me how do we scale that up that whatever solutions whatever i'm trying to do on the ground uh, it, 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 it turns into a project turns into something that uh, the solutions can uh, turn into something uh, that is implementable so just beyond having a seat uh, at the table is not enough. We already have a seat. So what is that? How do we scale discussion? How do we push uh, city level governments, uh, national level governments, even international partners? I don't want to call them donors, even international partners. How do whatever community initiative that have been able to amplify at those global spaces, how do I get resource to trickle down and it becomes a project? So let's look beyond just having a seat at the table. We are already at the table. The question is, what next? We are here with the decision makers. What is next? And I'm glad this idea of, um, first of all, to borrow from the resilience hubs. Uh, initially, I used to see everybody being lumped together, Asia, Africa, 
uh, indigenous communities, uh, people who are working on ocean risk, somebody trying to save the snow. We are lumped together. But the idea of regional hubs where we speak, if it's the African, our issues probably in a way uh, and our messaging, uh, it, it, it's more contextualized in an African setting. The challenges are cut across. If you go to Asia, uh, you will find that uh, the ocean front communities, they have their, so I think the idea of resilience uh, clustering the hubs, it's, it's brilliant, not everybody coming with their own little problem. Uh, so that's something that probably needs also to be amplified. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Joe. What an important point that in many ways we do have a seat at the table already as civil society, as some of these constituencies. It's really about what next and how we get to action. I'll say to our audience, because you can't see our team's back end, and I said this is why I love panels like this, because not only is it uh, very dear colleagues of mine, but everyone has so much to say. There are so many hands going up in the back end to respond. So if it seems a bit random that I'm calling upon people, it's, it's not. It's because they've raised their hands in the back end. And with that, Saqib, over to you for your reflections. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to also maybe pick up on, on the points uh, that were brought out in the sense that particularly at the international level, something that really gets marginalized is the agency of local communities, whether they be subnational government entities or local organizations or youth networks, or women's associations, any of the like, is that because you're downstream, you don't have capacity, you don't have experiences, you don't have, you know, relevant um, work history or a, really a legitimacy on, on being able to involve yourself in larger funded programs and larger projects and so on, particularly those that come from a, a international forum, such as the, the climate conventions. But then there are other spheres similarly that have also faced similar challenges in being able to get funding down to local entities because of this problem, this issue of the local entities and local actors not being deemed legitimate, having enough diligence between themselves. And I think as, as we just heard, there's obviously quite a lot of capacity. These are entities and these are associations and organizations that are doing the work regardless of whether you're funding them today or not. They're finding the resources and coordinating and organizing themselves because it needs to be done. They're living in that reality. It's not something that they can step in and out of as, as freely as we as researchers, being in the community, doing the research and then come outside and, and I'm able to join on a nice conversation online. The communities are still there. They're still dealing with it. They'll be doing that work there tomorrow and the day after. And I think what comes out of that is something that our organization has been trying to sort of find better ways of synergizing is really understanding that everybody who's at the table can bring different skills. It doesn't need to be a homogenous set of things and not everybody has to have the same CV and the same sort of diligence. Um, to be able to apply and have a seat at the round table when you're having these discussions, particularly when you're making decisions, working with policymakers and working with uh, government entities and so on, where decisions need to be made in terms of how the new strategy will be done, how the new funding programs will be coming, where the budgets will be going, and not not everybody needs to look the same. You don't have to be equally you know, rated as, as the similar uh, financial institutions to be able to receive funds. Somebody else in the table can help you do that. And where is that part? partnership going to come unless we're able to provide this type of a space where people can really talk and get to know about the work that other people are doing and say, yes, maybe that bit that we can help you with, we'll take the burden on that side and allow the local organizations to work. And, and Emil and I are in part of a, a project where we're really looking at how that sort of collaboration, that radical sort of partnerships can really turn the system across because what we've seen in, in the last 30 years of the COPS is that from particularly in the climate sphere, it's only through accredited organizations and it's only through the, the usual suspects that get accredited that can really handle the money, that can really move the funding across from different funding channels of the UNFCCC or any other bilateral donor. And it goes to the same usual suspects and really business as usual has not served that purpose in being able to bring funding down to the local level. And so partnerships on, on how you might be able to break that away from a larger entity, maybe not immediately, but build to that progress. How do you build that partnership so that somebody with a little bit more uh, um, ability to manage funds 
funds and do the monitoring that the donors do require, but being able to send that more closer to the communities and the activities and the initiatives that are happening on the ground. So just echoing on the point that, you know, really the partnerships that we come out of from some of these networks and some of these forums that we create, they take a little while to build and come into fruit. But this is something that we really should be plugging going ahead is how do we really foster these types of partnerships to happen at the local level across regions as well. So I'll, I'll hand over to the other hands in the room. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sakib. And excellent points there around recognizing community agency, but also pursuing these radical collaborations and how we operationalize and take things forward. Paolo, before I hand over to you to reflect on this discussion, I'll add a question onto that as well, uh, which you can touch on in your remarks, which are what are some of the priority key messages and solutions from the Latin America and Caribbean regional hub in the build up and drumbeat to COP29? And then also looking forward to Towards COP30. So, Paolo, for your reflections on this particular question, but also then speaking to priorities, et cetera, and key messages moving forward. Over to you, Paolo. Thank you, Amil. Uh, I raised my hand to, to react on, on Joe's comment and, and to support uh, his reflections uh, and also the call for what's next, right? And what can be the role of the Resilience Hub in that what's next? <laughs> Uh, I think we are in times that requires us to think and to act, mostly to act most audaciously, to um, the, raise the bar uh, to the challenges of our times, right? In times of war, of um, increasingly impacts of climate change. How can we make, build more and stronger spaces of dialogue like this one, but that also lead us to act? And on what's next, uh, I think one important aspect uh, that there's a lot of opportunity for us to enhance as a community is how do we build narratives that uh, support and provide the evidence and the stories that there's no solution that is more effective and efficient to climate action than those that are locally led. Uh, that, than those that are driven by the knowledge of local communities uh, and indigenous people. But this needs to go beyond our bubble. I think that's well established within the climate bubble. Uh, how do we go beyond that? And what role can the Resilience Hub have in going beyond this bubble? So bringing together uh, local governments, uh, actors from the finance and private sector, but also from communications, why not bring to these conversations influencers and start making trends of the conversations on how do we really uh, respond to climate change? Not in complex, complicated terms that are very familiar to us in this space, but really speaking the language of everyone who is, who is living the impacts of climate change and who are faced with all the uncertainties of the future. I think it's our responsibility and we have an opportunity as part of the Resilience Hub to build hope, stories of hope based on care, uh, on nature, uh, on cooperation, on radical collaboration. I think this is all uh, very natural to to the, the oh, sorry, uh, sorry, a call. <laughs> Uh, so this is very natural to the to the resilience hub and a great opportunity for us to work on the roads to COP30. And to close that on COP30, uh, I think there are many messages that we can highlight. They are mostly related for Latin American, at least on nature and nature restoration. Uh, you probably all have been following the fires that are devastating Latin America. We have had almost double the focus of fires than in previous years in Latin America. So we can expect that next year, as we are about to meet uh, in Belen at COP30, we will be leaving again grief for forests in Latin America, which is reaching every day more also communities in urban cities that are uh, facing the, the smoke uh, and all the, the impacts of the forest fires. So it's time not only to speak and to think about taking to COP, but mostly what are the propositions, the solutions that we will build on the road to COP to avoid this, these fires and these impacts, uh, adapting communities and responding and restoring to the effects that are already facing our region. So I hope that 
for COP30, we think not only of messages, but concrete proposals that are on the table for us to take this responsibility. <laughs> Thanks. Excellent. Thanks so much, Paula. And I'll be in Colombia later this month for the Biodiversity COP and primarily to really see these concrete intersec uh, intersections and entry points for bringing together this action. Uh, uh, those of you who may not know me, I work a lot on climate finance and of course biodiversity finance, development finance, coordinating and transforming these different funding landscapes will be quite crucial in then operationalizing uh, some of these intersecting points and synergies. Colleagues, we're, we're already starting to near the end of this session and need to, to get towards the wrap-up, but I really wanted to give a brief moment to Saqib and, and to Patimo and Joseph just to very briefly touch on some of the key messages that from the South Asia Regional Hub perspective you really want to see carried through to COP29 and beyond. So, Saqib, if I can give you just a minute or two to speak to that. Thank you. Uh, I, very succinctly, I think what's what's always become an issue in these uh, forums and the adaptation initiatives that we've been working with, particularly with uh, NGOs and organizations that are more on the ground, is is funding. They're they're obviously starved of a lot of the resources that come through. In many cases, it's because of all the different channels that the funding needs to be going through that siphons off quite a lot. Uh, legitimate charges on banking, on weather transfers, on on overheads for other organizations that need to be involved in the management and you would think that over time that is something that you would be able to streamline by having more partnerships with local organizations where they're able to come to the fore but unfortunately that's not something that we've seen happen over the last 30 years of the discourse on climate and on again again in, in different forums as well on biodiversity on desertification and so on so funding is one really really critical issue that's been something that has been a common thread that's gone through all the different sessions that we've been doing over the various regional hubs and the other one that as i mentioned is the enthusiasm for partnership. There are loads of actors out there that are been in this sphere for very many years, for decades and before, but there are newer organizations coming through. A lot of them are being done through communities that previously were extremely marginalized, both in their own national context, but also at the international forums, and are slowly starting to get that pace where we're starting to see a little bit more em emphasis on having indigenous peoples being included, on having persons with disabilities included, on having greater focus on or associations and work with uh, women's groups and gender responsiveness and youth responsiveness and so on, where where, again, we need to be moving out of that tokenism of just having people be on a panel just to say that we tick that box. But what happens before and after that panel has convened? How do we make sure that that was meaningful? And that's been one of the key messages on our uh, sessions coming out of the region is that really getting out of that tick box session, how can we make this a meaningful partnership to go through? And I think as somebody mentioned earlier on, a lot of this happens in in the sort of sidelines of these conventions and these these forums and networks that we have so again we encourage people to join these calls half an hour 15 minutes early to make that connection so it's not just a panel that you are sitting on with but you get to actually meet the other participants you get to meet with them you sit with them in a coffee shop in a convention where usually back in your home countries everybody would be busy in an office and not give you the time of day but you're in a convention nobody else is going to be here to disturb you so you take them for a lunch you sit with them for a sandwich or a coffee but make that connection happen so again uh, the, the key messages from our side would be making sure that the funding goes down to the local level as efficiently and properly as possible and making sure that you're doing it, bringing everybody inclusively and through partnerships. Thanks, Akib. And, and when I, whenever I chat to just regular folks in my life, friends and family, and they ask me what I do, I try and contextualize it for them in a very personal way. I say, tell me what you spend your money on, and I'll tell you what you actually value and not just what you say you value. Um, and I think in many ways, getting finance to the local level and where it really matters and how we track that and understand that progress over time will really be one of the measures on whether or not we are rising to the occasion. And like Joe was saying, in many regards, some of these constituencies are at the table or are recognized, but we really aren't seeing those next steps and those actions and hearing across not just the past two days of programming, but the past three years of the Resilience Hub and more broadly, this urgent call for getting finance to the local level and into the hands of communities in a way that really matters to them and allows them to respond to their own priorities. So we don't have much time left, but Patimo uh, and Joseph, uh, Patimo, let's maybe just turn to you for a minute or two on some of the, the key messages for from, from the Africa Regional Hub. Go ahead, Maximo. 
Thanks, thanks very much. And very briefly, um, I'd also like to stress the point about the finance. Um, so from the perspective of the Africa Regional Hub um, and from the continent's perspective, um, you know, one of the crucial themes and key mes messages has been around climate um, finance and investment. Um, this remains one of the critical barriers to addressing um, climate change on the continent and to enhancing resilience of our people. Um, and of course, we know of financing um, adaptation is also a major um, challenge. So in terms of regional uh, priorities for COP, um, at least for the next COP, which is deemed uh, or termed a, a finance COP, um, the priorities are around, you know, the need for ambitious outcomes regarding climate finance and the, and the NCQG, for example, including um, not just the quantity of finance, but um, really emphasis on the quality of finance, um, you know, addressing issues around de debt sustainability, um, um, providing high quality concessional finance, um, issues around transparency and accountability of finance as well. Um, and of course, um, you know, enhancing uh, or, or ambition on or, or, or pledges around adaptation finance um, and starting to really close the adaptation finance gap. Um, so we know that the Glasgow Climate Pact urges developed countries to at least double funding um, provided to developing countries for, for adaptation by 2025. And so really starting to see, um, you know, these, these goals put, be put into action um, is, is um, one of the key messages that I'll emphasize now. We have other messages, of course, around key priorities for the region around agriculture, um, also around on culture and heritage that we've we've used um, we've had in the past and and we've used the subsequent years to really build on these um, and we have expert uh, uh, perspectives um, on these um, in the form of blogs and and opinion pieces that are available on the Resilience Hub uh, website as well for the Africa Regional Hub. So I won't go into those, but yeah, I welcome everyone to visit them on on the website. Um, thanks. Thanks very much, um, Patim. Joseph, go ahead. On my side, um, I think my colleagues really did uh, mention, and the message is almost the same. And I like Paula mentioning maybe we should bring in influencers and, and, and the youth. I will really support that uh, together with uh, Sakip also mentioned the youth, and then and, and we add the women. And they need to come at the table. And I want, let me end by one example to show that sometimes our partners, you wonder if they are really committed to what they say. If you look at even they are funding this platform, which is a, is a, is a good platform, which is the a few of them really bring community to this big conversation. But look at how this this year it has been a a mission to fundraise for 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 for, for this uh, network this platform uh, we used to send around uh, between 10 and uh, above to cope but now this year we are only able to send three that shows really uh, how um you sometimes you you wonder um, if what is being spoken in big meetings but when we look at the action it's different uh, but nevertheless uh, our message is going to be the same um, that let's include poor communities uh, who are really uh, the custodian of whatever we, we, we are doing into planning. Let's bring them in decision making. Let them be part of um, whatever is being done. And, and also let's remember that uh, whatever project we, which, which we need to, to, to bring, let it be a, an answer to what is their requirement. And 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 the, the examples have been there that if if they when they are trained, uh, they can really provide evidence. Uh, they can come up with uh, what are the missing, what is need of the, uh, in in the communities. So um, our message is that let's include them into everything which is being done into their names. Uh, then uh, the end is really let's see the finances coming at the at the bottom way uh, implementation is, is happening. Um, yeah, I think that that is our message and this is uh, the message we, we are going to take to COP29 as well as COP30. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Joseph. And thank you, of course, to all of our panelists. The final point I'll make for our audience's benefit is that, of course, these are organizations leading the regional hubs, but they're also managing partners of the Resilience Hub and are very intimately involved in 
the programming of the events that will take place at COP itself and really ensuring that these key messages, these lesser heard voices and constituencies, etc., are integrated across the Resilience Hub programming. So in case you weren't actually aware of how all of this may relate to what happens at COP itself, I thought I'd point that out. I'd like to now uh, introduce a very dear colleague of mine, Jesper Hornberg, who's the CEO of the Global Resilience Partnership, another one of our managing partners of the Resilience Hub, to give some closing remarks and, and wrap, wrap up these past two days of, of interesting and, and critical discussion. So Jesper, over to you. Thank you so much, Emil. Um, lovely, um, lovely to listen in on, on, on these conversations. Now, how, how do you how do you summarize um, this conversation? I have three minutes, two and a half minutes. So I'm 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 going to go very easy on on myself. Um, I think you've all said it. It's it's wonderful to see these conversations. I think it's wonderful to see that the silos are breaking between the regions. Um, I think we need to come together. Uh, a very important point. Several very important points were made, but if I can just highlight one, Sakib, you said. Um, it takes time to form and work together. So we need to allow ourselves that time because as we as we start engaging with each other, it's it's also a question of, of getting to know each other and trust each other. Um, we need that. Um, I think we need the, the reach, the network. Um, we need to explore ways of, of getting getting the, the right voices into the room um, in, 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 a, in the right way. I think we need the courage. Um, to, to work together and, and, and break down the it sometimes imagined um, the borders and barriers that are in place. Um, because I think what, what, what this group is bringing to the table is, is very important. And I'm very happy that, that we can do these things online um, uh, this year, since we're not having the, the regional climate, climate leagues. I'm going to stop there. I have 30 seconds left. Um, it's wonderful to see you all. Um, lovely conversation. And I, I really look forward to engaging with um, many of you at COP um, in Baku and, and then in, in, in Brazil. So thank you very much. Back to you, Emil. Thanks so much, Jesper, and sorry for leaving such a short amount of time for closing remarks. Before we end, and if you aren't aware, the Resilience Hub at COP is a hybrid space, so you can join the events at the Resilience Hub virtually. So please do check out the Resilience Hub website and find out how you sign up for that and find out when the events are. Thank you again, everyone on our panel and for joining us and for joining us over the past few days. We look forward to continuing this conversation in the build up to COP29. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.